Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to us humans. Because can you believe it? God's favor rests upon us. Transfiguration has become one of my very favorite Sundays in the church here. Easter's the best. That's got to be the best, right? But transfiguration is in my top five for sure, maybe top three. And, and part of the reason why is because it brings our epiphany journey to an end. During epiphany, we've gone, if you will, to the mountaintop. We have seen Jesus turn water into wine. We've heard Jesus speak as he spoke the Sermon on the Mount. As we've compared what Jesus said with what the Old Testament said that the Messiah would say, when we look at what Jesus did and compare it to what the Old Testament said that the Messiah would do, we come to the conclusion, yeah, this is the Christ. This is the promised one. This is the one who the prophets had talked about, for sure. And Transfiguration Day, pardon the pun, takes us to the mountaintop, doesn't it? Wow! You look at Jesus on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration and you just go, yeah, that's the Son of God. Look at him. Look at his face shining like a flash of lightning. Look at his clothing gleaming like the sun. Look at the glory. That's the Son of God. And so you can totally get why Peter, James, and John are saying, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Mountaintop experience, right? Amen? You ever thought about the intimacy involved in this, however? Think about it. To whom are you willing to reveal intimate details about your life? I would suggest that you and I only reveal intimate details about our life to people that we really, really trust. True? Yeah, I think so. Well, interestingly, our text begins with the statement, eight days later, both Matthew and Mark's gospel this, re this event is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does not record it because Matthew, Mark, and Luke already have it covered. But both Matthew and Mark also have a time stamp. In Matthew and Mark, it's about six days later. Jewish timekeeping is hard because days start at twilight time. So when exactly is twilight time? Have we started a new day or have we not started a new day? So Jewish timekeeping gets a little awkward. And that's why you'll see variances on these things. It's not a big deal. But... Since it's mentioned in all three accounts, that gives us the understanding that God kind of wants us to know what had happened about a week earlier. Okay, what had happened about a week earlier? About a week earlier was when Jesus was talking to his disciples about his upcoming sufferings and death. And what Peter had done as Peter had come to Jesus and taken Jesus aside. Now remember, it's Peter, the sinful human being, taking aside Jesus, who is God. And Peter, the sinful human being, is saying to Jesus, God, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Peter is rebuking Jesus. Can you imagine? The sinful human being is rebuking the holy, all-powerful Son of God. What's wrong with this picture, huh? And it was at that point that Jesus said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Well, now fast forward eight days later, and you're Peter. And all of a sudden, Jesus gives you a glimpse of his glory. Oh, man, clothes shining like the sun, face like a flash of lightning. Can you imagine Peter thinking back to eight days earlier and thinking, what in the world was I doing? What in the world was I thinking? 
I was rebuking him? What was I doing? What would it be like to look into the face of God himself? Do you think we'd have reacted any differently than Peter reacted? Imagine that you're looking straight into the face of God himself. <laughs> and you know all that stuff that you'd really not like anybody else to know about? You know those thoughts, those words, those deeds, those desires? Laid bare. Oh boy. Can you imagine and understand why Peter is face down on his face, terrified? Matthew's gospel tells us that, by the way. Gives us that detail. Yeah, because everything in his life is laid bare. He was forced to come to grips with the reality of his sinfulness in a way that he had probably never, ever been forced to come to grips with. And make no mistake, brothers and sisters, all of that stuff is laid bare before the eyes of the one who knows all things. He knows our thoughts. He knows our words. He knows our deeds. And he hates our sin. He hates it. And it's earned for us an eternity in hell. I get why Peter, James, and John were face down on the ground terrified. I'd have been that and more. And yet what does Jesus do? Can you imagine? He trusts them. These guys who have been oh so untrustable, he trusts them by revealing this glimpse of his glory to them, this most intimate detail, I guess you could call it, and then adding trust to trust as they're walking down the mountain. Again, Matthew's gospel gives us the detail that Jesus says to them, um, guys, don't tell anybody about this until after I've been raised from the dead. Matthew's account tells us that Jesus asked them to do it. Luke's account tells us that apparently they actually did what he asked. <laughs> But they didn't tell anybody until after Jesus was raised from the dead. But stop and you think about it. They've just seen this absolutely stupendous sight. Jesus revealing a glimpse of his glory. Moses and Elijah there with glory and power. They've sort of met Moses and Elijah. And now Jesus says, hey, yeah, guys, you know what? Let's just kind of keep this between us for a while, shall we? <laughs> what? How am I going to do that? And yet Jesus trusted them. What amazing grace. What amazing mercy. And can you believe it? He trusts you and me too. He trusts you and me to keep on listening to him. He trusts you and me to be his witnesses in the world. He trusts you and me to stand firmly on his words and promises. We who have been so untrustworthy, he trusts us. And all of that is absolutely amazing, isn't it? So cool. But I still don't think it quite gets us to why the Transfiguration account is such an awesome, awesome account. And this will sound maybe kind of funny to say it, but it's because it comes to an end. The cloud comes and it envelops Peter, James, and John, and the voice speaks, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And then they look up and what do they see? Just Jesus. The 
Clothes are normal. Face is normal. Moses and Elijah have gone away. And what does Jesus do? He purposely and purposefully walks away from the Mount of Transfiguration and walks to an entirely different mountain. The one that you know as Mount Calvary. And you know what's going to happen at Mount Calvary. But doesn't Mount Calvary shine all the more brilliantly with the Mount of Transfiguration in the background? Jesus is glorious. He's powerful. He's almighty. He's got all power in heaven and on earth. And he purposely and purposefully walks away from that and is willing to exchange it for whipping, beating, spitting on, nails, and burial cloths. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. Amazing. So what is the whole point of this transfiguration event? Is it so that Jesus can show off his power? Nah. Jesus doesn't need to show off. Is it so that we sinners can be scared by seeing the glory of God and realizing how much we deserve God's judgment? Well, it accomplishes that. <laughs> but no, I don't think that's the point. Is it so that we can get a little glimpse of heaven? Moses and Elijah were there visiting with Jesus face to face, and they weren't afraid at all, were they? Someday you're going to get to do that too. Is that the point? I think it's certainly a great lesson. But would you agree with me that the ultimate point of the transfiguration event is that God can remind you yet again of how much He loves you? Yeah. That's the point. Because He wants you to know without any doubts whatsoever that what's going to happen on Mount Calvary happens because He loves you. He wasn't forced into it. He didn't have to do it from a power standpoint. But He did. And so, my brothers and sisters, our epiphany journey comes to an end. Oh, it's been a mountaintop experience, hasn't it? As we've once again seen Jesus as who He is, the Son of God, the Almighty. But now let's turn our sights and journey along with Him to Mount Calvary. Oh, there's going to be sadness along the way as we see the incredible failure and sinfulness of us human beings as we see the incredible injustice that's heaped upon Jesus, the blood, the gore, it's ugly. But in reality, it's Mount Calvary where the glory of God shines the most brilliantly. Because it's at Mount Calvary where God proves His love for you once and forever. And so, my brothers and sisters, let's go to the mountaintop, shall we? Amen?